Well, all right, glad you're here on this beautiful Wednesday, midweek study. We're going to continue tonight uh, talking about some of these questions that come up on these college campuses. Some of, the, uh, some of those who claim to be atheists or Muslims, some of the things they'll ask trying to get disprove God, disprove the Bible or Jesus. That's what we'll continue tonight on, on those. Well, again, a word of prayer first. And uh, Bill Pennington, would you lead some prayer, please? It's not on the screen, but I was looking at some today, some questions they were asking. This one was real quick. It won't take long to cover it, but uh, there was a girl there, and she asked this guy, she said, I'm an atheist. Do you believe I'm going to hell? And he said, you being an atheist, why do you believe in hell? And that was it. So again, I said, that was his answer to her. Uh, so anyway, here's our first one tonight. If God is real, why doesn't he just show himself to everyone to convince people that he is real? And why doesn't he give me the type of evidence that I want? God has given plenty of evidence that he is God, that he is real. 93% of the world's population believes in a God of some sort. That leaves only 7% that do not believe in a God and who, who are consider himself to be atheist, of course. But however, God does not give us the evidence that we want. And if he were, if we were to say, God, you got to do this for I believe it, it'd be, it'd be the wrong thing to do. That would be tempting God. And of course, we don't want to tempt God in doing that. But God says, I have put plenty of evidence there for you to see. And you have the opportunity, you have the choice to believe it or not. But uh, some people, individuals will say, well, if you just do it the way I want it, if you show the evidence I'm asking for, then I will believe you. Well, again, that's not the right way of doing it. What if a, a, a young woman tells a young man, she says, I love you. And he says, well, prove it. Have sex, something like that with me. I say, is that right? No, she shouldn't have to prove her love in a sense like that. No, it shouldn't be that way. And yet how many times have we heard individuals, or maybe, maybe we've done it as well. We find ourselves in a situation that, that was a pretty dire situation. And we say, God, if you'll get me out of this, I will do this and this and this. Well, that's not right either. Here we're saying to God, we're putting it on him, you've got to do what I tell you to do, or else I'm not going to serve you. That's not the way it works. The way it works is it's, God, I'm going to do this regardless. I'm going to love you. I'm going to serve you. If you never bless me, it's another blessing in my life. If you don't pull me through this, I'm still going to do what is right. But I've heard many individuals say that very thing. If you will do it my way, trying to manipulate God, then I'll do what I want to do, what I need to do, and that's not correct. So here, why doesn't he give the type of evidence that I want? Well, that's not God. Again, he, he's not going to do that. He's provided evidence. And we see that in Romans 1, uh, 20 and 21. Uh, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So again, there we have, he has given us enough to show that uh, certainly he is God. So uh, the problem is that, that we want to do things our way. We want God to prove things our way. And he's given us plenty of proof. But again, it's up to us to accept that evidence that he's, that he's put out there. The next question. How can you prove that Jesus resurrected? Have you ever seen a resurrection? Outside the Bible, what evidence 
do we have that Jesus really existed, that he rose from the dead? Uh, those are several questions bundled into one. And here are some answers to all these questions. One would be that the thousands of Jews changed their worship based on the resurrection. That tells you something, that he resurrected. Now, people of the Jewish religion, as, as in, in depth, ingrained as it was in them, they wouldn't just give it up, uh, the, the old mosaic way of doing things. There had to be something there to convince them, to show them that this Jesus is for real. And during the time of the, of the, uh, of the Gospels there, and then after the 40 days after Christ resurrected, a lot of changes took place. Remember on the day of Pentecost, 3,000. A few days after that, 5,000. And it just kept growing and growing. Again, the resurrection was proof enough for them uh, that either they saw him or they talked to somebody who did see him. So therefore, they, they knew it was going on. And of course, people saw Jesus after the resurrection. Uh, they, they had evidence. They wrote it down uh, about what they saw. So they knew that it was true. And the last one there, many gave their lives because of what they saw. No myth, no legend, no fairy tale. Uh, no one is going to die for a myth. Nobody's going to give their life or suffer for a fairy tale. You know, uh, the three bears, you know, the three bears eating the, or that, Goey locks and three bears. Who's going to die for that saying, that's real, that really happened? Nobody's going to do that. But these individuals here, these apostles, they did. Uh, they, they were martyrs because of that, and they knew that it was true. They saw him. They were with him. So that's a, that's a, very, a very compelling evidence right there. Somebody who would give their life or something, they, are, they know, at least they're convinced that this is real, that it happened. Another answer to this would be historical evidence of a resurrection found in the Gospels. Uh, historical evidence, there's a man who died on the cross. He was raised three days later. Uh, he came up out of the tomb, of course, and then for 40 days afterwards, he was with the people. They talked with him. They, they touched him. They ate with him. They communicated with him, and they all wrote about this. And uh, Jesus appeared to those who, who needed to see him. That's who he appeared to. He didn't appear to uh, someone who never heard of him or somebody who knew nothing about his death. That would mean nothing. But he appeared to those who needed to see him so they could carry this on with them. And as the apostles did and many others did. So there's, there is historical evidence. In 1 Corinthians 15, there's all kind of evidence there are individuals who said, who, who was written to many people that he uh, appeared to. So there is historical evidence in there in the scriptures. Another answer to that question about the resurrection. We have non-Christian sources that speak of the resurrection of Jesus. We have Josephus. We, he's often quoted in uh, being a Jewish historian. He lived from 37 to 100. and He wasn't even alive when Jesus was on the earth. But he did write from evidence of people who did see him. He wrote about Christ. Now, he didn't believe he was the Son of God. He didn't believe that. But he wrote about, there was this group of followers. He called them a tribe of Christians, is what he called them. A tribe of Christians who uh, spoke a lot about this Jesus, about this resurrection. So he was around when they were talking these things up, talking about them. Another was uh, Suetonius, another Roman historian. He lived 70 to 160, and he spoke, he wrote about a group of Christians who believed in the resurrection. He, he wrote about them. They believed this. Now, he didn't. He said it was a superstition, but yet he wrote about them and what the things that they believed and how they went about worshiping. So that shows you that they were there. They were they were taking part in just everyday life and, and people were noticing them and talking about them. And then Pliny the Younger, who lived from 62 to 113, he wrote about a group of Christians uh, meeting on Sunday in memory of Jesus' resurrection day. That's what he wrote about. 
Again, he wasn't a Christian, but he wrote about here's what these people are doing. They're coming together on the first day of the week on Sunday in memory of Jesus' resurrection. That would be the Lord's Supper. That's the memory that we, we still take of that today, remembering what was taking place. And those are three of the more uh, prevalent individuals who, who spoke about, so they're non-Christian sources. So you have the Bible, of course, and you have uh, those who witnessed Christ, and then you have those who talked to individuals who very well may have seen him, non-Christian sources that wrote about him. So there's plenty of, again, evidence there that Christ did resurrect. The next question was asked by a Muslim. Where in the Bible does it say Jesus is God? That's a big one for them. Where in the Bible does it say it? Well, at least three places. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you that before Abraham was, I am. That phrase, I am, is a phrase that, that uh, the Jewish individuals would know that means God. Nobody used that phrase. I mean, it was, it was a blasphemy to use that phrase. And after John 8, 58, they accused him of, of blasphemy. And they were about to kill him. And he had to, to, to flee. They took up stones to kill him. They knew what it meant. Jesus said, I am. I am. That means I'm God. And John 10 and verse 30, he said, I and the Father are one. The Jews knew exactly what he meant. They, him and, and God are equal. And because he said this, again, they took up stones to kill him. They were ready to kill him. They knew what he meant by this. And then in John 20 and 28, when he did appear to Thomas, doubting Thomas of this time, that's when Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Thomas called him God, and Thomas certainly was right. So for a Muslim to say that Christ never said that he was God, or the Son of God will be wrong, uh, because he did. Now, a Muslim may uh, deny the Bible, the credibility of the Bible, they, they probably would do that. But uh, again, they got to get it from somewhere. And you can't go to the Bible and pick and choose. This is true, this is not true. You take all of it, you take none of it. And that's what you got to do with, with the scriptures. So Jesus, on different occasions, showed that he spoke that he was God. The next question. Uh, why was it necessary for God to create the world, to create mankind? Well, we don't know why. We don't know why God created. We're not told why. We're just told that he did. Uh, he didn't have to. We just don't know why he did. He didn't create mankind because he was lonely. God doesn't need us. We've got to figure that out. Sometimes we think we're more important than we are. God doesn't need us. He is God, fully self-sufficient in all things. One might say, well, God needed to be worshipped. No, he does. He doesn't need to be worshipped. Worship is for us. Worship is for us to understand, to recognize a higher being than ourselves. Somebody worthy as God is, perfect in every way. It helps us to look to someone else besides ourselves. But God didn't create us to worship Him. Uh, our, our worship is to, to benefit us. Went out there. Okay. So, why was it necessary? Well, we don't know. We don't know why, it was, why God did it. Maybe we can ask Him one day, why did you do that? Well, we'll be happy. He'll be happy to tell us. Be in a good place for Him to tell us. Next, which is accurate, the Quran or the Bible? Of course, that was asked by a, a Muslim individual. Well, the answer to all this is, several answers, Christianity is focused on Jesus. That's everything from, from Genesis to Revelation. The thread that runs all the way through it is Jesus. He's coming, he's here, he's coming back. That's the thread that runs through the Bible. 
Now, Islam is focused on the Quran. Now, they got Muhammad. They look at him as being a big prophet, and he certainly was to them. But they look at the Quran, the book itself, as being a miracle. And that's the only really miracle they can speak about. Because to fully understand it, it's got to be read in Arabic. And when you ask them who wrote the Quran, they always say God wrote it, not Muhammad. Because Muhammad was Ill illiterate, uh, couldn't, couldn't read, he couldn't write. But then again, the book came about through him when he was uh, 40 years old. It said that the, uh, the angel Gabriel uh, gave him instructions on what to write. And he wrote for 23 years. 23 years, not all at one time, but he wrote it down. And, uh, and when he completed it in 632, he died. So there again, they were claimed that it's the book itself that's a miracle. And really not Muhammad. He was, he was a prophet. They're one that they're going to follow. But the miracle was just how it came about to be written. Well, compare that to the Bible. If it took him uh, 23 years to write it, how many years did it take to write the Bible? Approximately. 1,400, 1,500 years. How many writers? 40, 40 writers. Over this period of time of writing, and not one time do they contradict each anyone. There's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ. They're all fulfilled. Uh, archaeology proves the Bible time and time and time and time again. You have proof. So you got, you got, you got the Koran, and they got their reasons, but the Bible, you have by far more reasons to believe in it. It's, uh, it is uh, inspired by God. Uh, the next, another answer to this. Muslims claim the Gospels are inaccurate. If they are inaccurate, then where are the accurate Gospels? Where are they going to get their information from? They believe you know, that Jesus existed. But then again, they just want to pick and choose from the Gospels what they want to believe about Christ. You either take it all or you take none of it. That's what you got to do. The Muslims want us to believe that, that 500 years after Jesus, Muhammad had a revelation that should be believed over the Gospels. So it is, so is something received 500 years after Jesus more accurate than witnesses who were with Jesus. Again, Christ had eyewitnesses that were there. None of the people today, no Muslims alive today, saw Muhammad. They were alive when all this took place. Neither are they have, they're having to base what they believe off evidence, just like we are believing off evidence that Christ existed, that he lived, and everything about him is true. But there's by far more evidence of Christ uh, than that of Muhammad. Another answer to that question, Muslims have a greater respect for Jesus than many Christians. That's hard to believe that they do. Many believe Jesus was born of a virgin, that he died and was resurrected and going to return. They believe that. Where do you get that from? You get it from the Gospels. That's where you get it. They believe that both Jesus and Muhammad spoke absolute truth. The problem is they contradict each other on certain issues, and tr truth never contradicts itself. So there, there's the problem. Jesus and Muhammad contradict. They say they both spoke absolute truth. Well, you don't contradict if you speak absolute truth. And here's some things that they, that they contradict each other on. The Quran says that God only loves those who obey him. And the Bible says that God loves everyone. There's a contradiction. The Quran says only two sons of Noah were saved from the flood. The Bible says the three sons of Noah were saved from the flood. Another, God told Adam what to name the animals. And the Bible says that Adam chose the names of the animals. In the Quran, certain meats are forbidden. In the Bible, at least in the New Testament part, all meats are for consumption. <clears throat> Another, on the Quran, hate your enemies and kill them. 
The Bible says, love your enemies. The Quran, God had no children. The Bible, Jesus is God's only begotten son. The Quran says that Jesus is a prophet. The Bible says that Jesus is the son of God. So there's, there's other contradictions. Those are some of the ones that we're more familiar with. They're there, so if the Quran is inspired and the Bible's inspired, they can't contradict, but yet they do. Who are we going to believe? Which God do we want to serve? Which God do we want to love? One that's going to love us as, as God does, or the one that's only going to love us if we, you know, if we, if we bow down and, and do exactly what he says? If not, he'll kill us. It's all about the, the, the concept of God. The God that the, the, Quran, that the Quran shows us versus the God that the Bible shows us. The God of the Bible is by far greater and more lovable, one that we want to serve than over the God that's shown to us in the Quran. Here's another resurrection question. Why should I believe in a resurrection since it has never happened again? Well, it's true that the resurrection hasn't happened since Christ was resurrected. But there's a lot of things that haven't happened since you know, the beginning of mankind, uh, the beginning of the universe. It's, it's, it's not going to happen again. God did all the creating one time. The beginning of human life. I'm talking about from nothing. That's never going to happen again. Uh, you take it as, like the discovery of penicillin. That's not going to happen again. You only discover it once. Or has George Washington been president again of the United States? That's only happened once. That's all that's going to happen. Uh, repeatability, as they want to claim here, uh, cannot, it can happen it with science, but it doesn't happen in history. History, we, we know we claim history is going to re repeat itself. Well, we understand that maybe some of the consequences may happen, but really it's not going to repeat itself. It's not going to happen in the exact same way, you know, it did the first time. It's not going to happen. So, uh, so to believe, to not believe that, that Jesus hasn't resurrected, unless you see another resurrection, that's not going to happen either. He certainly did. If God could create the universe, if he had the power to create the universe, don't you think he had the power to raise someone from the dead, especially his only begotten son? That would be nothing for him if he could do everything else about creation and yet raise Jesus, no problem. No problem whatsoever for him. And then the next question, if God is all-knowing, then what difference does it make if I believe in him or not? He can just look and see if I am saved or lost in the end. Isaiah 46 and verse 10 does say that God knows the end at the beginning. <clears throat> just because God knows the end doesn't make us do what we do. We still have a free will. Now God can, because he's all powerful, God can limit himself to not know what the end is going to be. He can do that. He can look, he can know, or he can wait. So I'm just going to wait. But that has no bearing on what I'm doing today because of what, how, how, how it's going to end. I don't know how it's going to end as far as uh, when, when it's going to end, the circumstances around it. But what I do know is when I get to the end, if I'm right with God, all is going to be well when I, when I stand before him one day. But God certainly can uh, limit his knowing. He would not be all-powerful if he couldn't do it. Uh, we have the power to limit our knowledge as well. If we, if we choose to do so, we have that power to do so. You're going to uh, be, a, say, a Christmas gift under the tree, and you're there all by yourself. You can open that gift up and look at it and wrap it back up, and on Christmas Day when you open it, act all surprised. You have the power to wait, or you have the power to open it. 
God has the power as well. So I'm going to wait. I'm just going to wait. And, see, and, and then, we'll, then we'll look at it then. So again, God's all-knowing doesn't take away our free will. We all have a free will. And then the last question, how can you say that your goodness and love comes from God? Why can't my morals be determined by my interactions with my parents, other people, or society? Why can't I determine my own morals? That's what they're saying. And that's a, that's a big thing today. Uh, wanting to get rid of the, of the past. Wanting to rewrite you know, the Constitution. It's, it's too old. It doesn't relate to me today. And they go to the Bible as well. How can it relate? A book as old as it is. How can it relate to what's going on here in 2024? I want to determine my own morals. That's what they're saying. Well, you, you can't do that. Here's an answer. If no God, then we create our own morality. Whatever I choose is moral. Whatever I choose is moral is moral. Morals have a way of changing over time. God's morals never change. And morals do. Uh, just look at our, our, our morals as a nation. Just how much it's changed in 10 years or 20 years. Our morals have greatly changed. And you go back even further, we see greater other things. But there's four things that determine morals. Myself, the majority of people, or the powerful people, or God. The three of them, first three, are going to change. What you decide is moral today may not be moral in a few weeks. It very well could change. The majority, majority changes things, we know. Whatever the majority wants, now well, that changes. Or the powerful, sometimes those in, the, in very powerful places have a way of changing morality. They can do that. They can push things on us, and, and it may be a slow way or a great way, or, but they can do that. But when it comes to God, His morality never changes. Because God doesn't change. He isn't going to change with the times. And yet you'll find a lot of folks uh, who wish that it was my way. Let me determine my own morality. And a lot of times they'll claim that government cannot, cannot uh, set morals. Government can't do that. Well, a lot of times government tries and, then, and they do but yet they, they'll change it according to what the people want or some high, powerful person ever change it. But that, one, that question is asked quite a bit because I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I want to do what I want to do. I want to determine it being right or wrong according to my actions. And that's where they go with it. So those uh, last three weeks on these, these questions... Uh, I, I've, I've learned a lot by listening to these individuals come up with the answers and, and how they go about answering them. Again, it'd be, it'd be good if we could show some of the videos, but some of these individuals are pretty hostile that uh, come against these individuals. Hostile in the words, how they want to, what they say, and, and we, just, we, can, we can get around that. We don't need that to hear what they Because you can, you can look at them sometime. Uh, Social media is full of them, YouTube and TikTok and things of that nature. Well, all right, thank you for your attention. Maybe we've all learned a little bit how to go about answering these questions or know what's going on on some of these college campuses. All you got to do is watch the evening news here the last couple of days. You see what's going on on a lot of them, how, how they're trying to, trying to change things. All right. We'll end here. I don't know what we'll take up next week. We'll take up a, a study on something next week.